Hi, this week on Musical Hacks, we're going to teach dogs to code. Well, we're not really, because actually all they want is the biscuits in my hand, but they might stay, stick around, they might not. This week on Musical Hacks, we're going to take the step sequencer that was just using ICs, and we're going to make it more flexible by using a microcontroller, in particular the Arduino Nano. To do that, we're going to also have a look at some of the implications, like how do we supply power to the microcontroller, and what kind of protection do we need to put in place so that we don't break it. In the last episode, we built this standalone step sequencer. In this episode, we want to take this further and control it with a microcontroller to give us some more flexibility. However, before I do that, I'd like to talk about some of the possibilities that exist even without a microcontroller for this circuit. The first thing that we could change in the step sequencer is we could actually create additional outputs. So for example, we could add a set of switches for each of these steps, or we could add additional output voltages with each controlled by pots or something. For each of those additional rows, we could use a different multiplexer. The other thing that we might consider we want to change is connected with the reset. So for example, what we could do is we could fit a reset button so that we could start the sequence from the beginning when we wanted to or by a trigger voltage. We also could get creative with the way the steps are going forward. So for example, we could have multiple counter chips that are running at different rates, which we could then combine with AND and OR gate. So the first extension I would like to look at with a microcontroller is actually removing this oscillator chip. Rather than run this from an oscillator, I would like to run this from a microcontroller. And what we'll do as well is take the opportunity to look at how we're going to supply the voltage to the microcontroller. The first thing that we need to consider when we are dealing with microcontroller is powers and voltage levels. I mentioned this in the first episode about different platforms, that the microcontrollers can operate off of 3.3 volts or 5 volts. It is imperative that you check the data sheet to see which yours is using. So here we have a few examples. This is an Arduino Nano, Arduino Micro, a Tinsy 3.2 and a SciPy. And they all deal with voltages slightly differently. The Arduinos use 5 volts and can accept and output 5 volts on the input and output pins. The TNC 3.2 is 3.3 volts but is so-called tolerant of 5 volts on the pins. This means that you can put 5 volts in onto the pins and it won't damage. However, the levels are 3.3. This SciPy is 3.3 volts and you will damage it potentially if you put in 5 volts on the pins. Similarly, the Axolotti is 3.3 volts. The Bella is 3.3 volts on the digital pins and 4 volts on the analog pins but tolerant to 5 volts. So you can see it's very important that we actually check the data sheet if we don't want to damage our chips. The other side that we have to think about is how much power to supply to the chip. Something like the Arduino is very flexible. You can supply it via USB 
Or you can also supply it by DC power, 6 to 12 volts on the V-in pin. And what it has is an internal regulator that actually will scale that voltage down to the 5 volts that's actually required by the microprocessor. You can also bypass that regulator by using the 5 volt pin. The other useful aspect of the microprocess board is using it to supply voltage. So this Arduino has a 5 volt output pin and it also has a 3.3 volt output pin. So we can actually use that. So we've talked about what our microcontroller boards require. But how do we get to these voltages if we've got something different? So first of all, let's talk about the supply voltage. For example, we might have something like Eurorack, which might be giving us 12 volts. We need a way of stepping that down to, say, 5 volts. And the way we do that is we actually use a regulator, which is what this thing here is. This takes an input voltage which is higher than we require and will step it down to the voltage that we require. And it will give us a stable voltage as well. You can get these from various different ratings. Now we need to consider how to step down input and output voltages. If we're just dealing with digital, then we can actually use one of these level shifter boards. These level shifters are very interesting because they're very simple to use. Essentially, we have two voltages on it. We have a high voltage and a low voltage, and it's bi-directional. We can put an input and an output, and this one has four level shifters in it, but it can only be used for digital signals. For analog inputs, we could use a simple voltage divider. Now, I showed you in the last episode how to create a voltage divider, and you can use it with simple fixed resistors values, or you could use something like this, which is a trim pot, which would allow you to do a voltage divider in quite a small package. The other thing that we can use to protect our inputs is a diode clamp, and I'd like to look at that now. Okay, so here is our diode clamp circuit. The important part is this area here. You can see we have a diode going from ground. We have another diode going back up to the maximum voltage, which at the moment I've got set at 3.3 volts. Then for a test, what I've done is I've connected a 9 volt battery to a potentiometer, which I'm using as a voltage divider. So if we turn this up, it goes from 0 to 9. You can see it goes up and then it stops at 3.6 volts. So that would be enough to protect this circuit. Now I've switched the high supply voltage to 5 volts. And again, we're going to send it up to 9 volts if we turn this up. Again, we can now see that we only get to 5.2 volts. So this would protect a 5 volt circuit quite happily. So you can now see that I've plugged in the Arduino Nano onto the board. You might hear some audio interference, so this is caused by a ground loop issue that we might cover later. The important element here, I'm now not using the power at all from the OM synth. I'm actually powering the whole circuit from the Arduino. Here you can see I've got a USB connection, which you can see is connected to the Arduino UI. You can see that I've now connected the 5 volt line of these breadboards to the VIN output of the Arduino and the ground to the ground of the breadboard. I've also connected the ground of the breadboard to the AE modular here directly. And I've got the 5 volt line here from the AE modular, which I've not got connected at the moment because I'm powering from USB. But later I'll show that we can run directly from the power of the AE modular. You can also see that I've got the Arduino IDE running. Now I'm not going to go into how to install this, there's plenty of good demos of that around. Let's just have a look what we've got though to get the patch running. This is the blink patch, which is the very first starter patch. 
which you can see is actually blinking the light on the Arduino here. The important things to set up here is inside the tools menu, you have to set the board type, you have to set the processor. You might find you need to use either the old bootloader or the newer one. And then finally, the port that it's on. Now, there are many issues at times getting Arduinos to run, particularly with clone boards and things like that. Again, I refer you to the internet because that's been well covered. The blink patch is very simple. We have two functions. We have the setup function, which is called just when the board starts or we upload a patch. Here what we're doing is we're saying that the LED pin will be set to output because we're going to output values to it. Then we have the loop function. This function keeps on getting looped over and over again. And you can see that all it does is it writes one or high to the LED, then it pauses for a second, then it writes low, which is zero, to the LED pin, and then it pauses for another second. And this is how we get it to blink. The important thing to recognize in this particular example is whilst this loop is running, no other code is running at all. So my first example is you'll have noticed on the board that I've removed the oscillator. So what we're going to do is to simply use the Arduino instead as that oscillator. And that's very simple. I'm going to use digital pin two here as the alternative to the oscillator. So I've got that routed over to the counter chip. Also for clarity, what I've done is I've taken an LED from that pin so that we can see when the pin goes high and low. And lastly, what I'm doing is I'm also taking that clock to the envelopes so that I can actually gate the VCA here. To make this change, all I therefore need to do is to change this example so that we output on digital pin two. And then we can upload that change to the board. Now what we can see is that we have the LED flashing and we can see that the sequencer is running. Reality is we don't need this high to be so long because so far we're doing a two second interval. We can simply change the delay to just one millisecond here. And again, upload the board. So a very simple change. Now let's go to the next stage. Let's get it so that we can now alter the speed of this oscillator. Okay, so I've now updated the code and also the circuit so that we can actually control the oscillator by this potentiometer. And I can go all the way to, and I can go all the way to audio range. So let's have a look at the circuit changes. I've created a voltage divider as covered in the second episode here for this potentiometer and I've taken this voltage dividing signal into A0. So this is coming from zero to five volts. Inside the code, I've simplified the previous Blink example, moved it into its own new file. And what I've done is, first of all, I've changed the pin numbers to being constant expressions so that they're easy to modify. There's been no change to the clock at all, except for this use of this constant expression. 
And then all I've done is change here a line where I read that analog pin, which will return between 0 and 1023, and use that to change the delay in between each loop cycle. As this delay is in milliseconds, that's going to mean that it's between potentially zero milliseconds and about a second. So far, the nano really hasn't given us anything extra. It's just working in the same way as our original oscillator. So the next step is what we're going to do is to take out the counter chip, because this will then allow us to actually handle the way we move through the sequence in different ways. I've updated the hardware and the software now to remove this counter chip. This means that the microcontroller is now in complete control of the MUX. It does this in a very similar way to the counter chips. We still have the three selection lines on the MUX, but these time they're connected to digital pins two, three, and four. Additionally, I've moved the gate that's being used for the envelope onto digital pin Five. The microcontroller is in complete control here. Now you'll remember that the MUX selects the output using digital logic. So output five is one, zero, one. Let's have a look at the code. So inside the code, what we can see is it's straightforward enough. Those three pins defined as a constant up at the top of the code to be pins two, three, and four. And we've said that the gate pin is on pin five. We set each of those pins to output in the setup step. I then have defined a constant variable for the maximum number of steps. Then we go onto the loop. We currently are just simply selecting the gate every time we go around the loop. So we switch it to high, delay for a millisecond, and then switch it to low. Then we move on to the section where we're going to actually select the outputs on the marks by using these step pins. So we're just going to, in the first example, just advance it forward by one, and we use the modulo operator to keep it within the bound zero to seven. And then when we write the digital output, we use binary logic. So that we use the lowest bit for step pin one, the next bit up for step pin two, and the final one for step pin four. And then we do as before, we look at the potentiometer to find out how long we're going to delay between steps. So we can see it's stepped through, and just as before, we can go all the way up to audio rate with this. Or down to about a second. But now the fun begins, because unlike with a counter chip, we can do things differently. So for example, by changing this step line, we can now simply select a random step. This is a random number between zero and seven. Or just as easily, we could make the step sequencer run backwards. The way the statement works is if the step is zero, then we use the maximum step seven. However, if the step is not zero, then we go down one step. So if it was five, we go to four. Again, upload. And we can now see we're running in reverse. So the most significant part of this is the control within the microcontroller. I've obviously shown only a simple example of random backwards forwards, but we could do all sorts of kind of logic. We also have control of the gate as well. So we can also choose to do something more complex with that. And also let's think about what we've achieved here. The first thing is we are seeing that we are getting 
analog inputs here. So we could use additional potentiometers. So not just controlling, for example, the rate, but we could use another potentiometer to select the number of steps that we're using. There are obviously also the ability to do a digital read off these digital pins. So we could use buttons. So for example, to toggle between the step sequences direction. So this is a very flexible way to build a step sequencer. Now, there is a very interesting side of this that we haven't covered yet. This Arduino Nano actually has eight analog inputs. So we could have actually written this code to simply connect these analog pots directly to the analog inputs. And then we could have just output them on the analog output that the Arduino Nano has. However, the issue with that is that we only have eight analog inputs. The way we've done this is we're actually only using one of them. And we're also only using really three digital pins. So this can be extended much further. We mentioned at the start of this video, for example, that using this same logic, we can actually replicate these potentiometers and use another MUX and get different automation lines. But what we can also do, use more potentiometers and a different MUX and actually create a longer sequence. So we could create, a, say, a step sequencer of 16 or 64 steps. Now the trick to that is that these MUX chips have an enable pin. And what that enables us to do is to actually from the microcontroller, using digital write again, is actually select which MUX we wish to use. So you can think of this as different automation lanes would be running the MUXs in parallel. And if we wanted longer sequences, they would be run in a series and we would select which MUX we were using by the microcontroller. The other thing that's probably important to realize here is that the voltages aren't actually passing through the microcontroller in this case. The microcontroller is simply switching the MUX. The voltages are actually from these potentiometers going directly through the MUX to the output. And this is important if we're using higher voltages. So one can imagine taking eight CV sources from your modular, passing those into the MUX, and then the microcontroller is selecting which of these is active. What's interesting about this is if we're using something like Eurovac, which is using higher voltages, then these voltages that are being piped through this MUX do not touch the microcontroller. The microcontroller is simply being used to select which output is actually being passed through. The final part I want to show today is of course this runs completely standalone. If I take out the USB, obviously nothing happens because it's now not got power, but I can use the voltage from the AE modular to power microcontroller. Now there's a couple of things that are interesting to note here. The first is the reason I can do this directly is because the AE modular is five volts. So in Eurorack, we could run also this circuit directly off the five volt line. However, if we decided we wanted to use the 12 volt line, then we would use a regulator between the 12 volts to give us five volts to the microcontroller. And that's where we started this video. The other thing just to end on is that now you will no perhaps notice that there's no audio issues. The audio issues we heard earlier come from the fact that my computer is supplying this USB so that I can program it, but it also supplies power to this microcontroller. The issue is we then get a ground loop through this microcontroller and out of this audio output here, which is also connected to my computer via an audio interface. So you might notice when you're developing your code and you're connected via USB, you get a ground loop issue. But fortunately, as soon as you give it its own 
power, that will disappear. So I think that shows that you can build quite complex sequences with actually very few components that are actually all very cheap. Obviously we could then move this to a PCB, put a panel on it, and then we have something that we could use in Eurorack or in AE Modular. The advantage of doing this ourselves is that we have the ability to reprogram this microcontroller. So we can come up with all sorts of creative algorithms and different ideas that we can use for our sequencer. In the next episode, I'd like to show this on Eurorack, but we'll concentrate on the software side. So what we'll do is we'll use Bella as the implementation platform for that.